Hey, in case you didn't know, tickets for IndyLand are available right now, and they're going real fast. The Nintendo 3DS, in my opinion, is one of the best handheld consoles of all time. Although the launch sales were pretty low, it would eventually go on to sell almost 76 million units. That's more than the Wii U, GameCube, and Nintendo 64 combined. Hell, the 3DS even sold more units than the original Nintendo Entertainment System. Although aspects like Glasses Free 3D, AR, and Street Pass may have been the early talking points for the Nintendo 3DS, the 3DS is such a beloved portable powerhouse that had some truly incredible titles and a very long shelf life compared to most consoles. Unfortunately, that shelf life is soon coming to an end as Nintendo is shutting down the 3DS eShop in March of 2023. So, to celebrate the legacy of this wonderful system, here are my top 10 favorite games released on the Nintendo 3DS. Before we dive too deep in today's video, I want to thank our sponsor, NordVPN. For those of you who don't know, NordVPN is a great tool to keep yourself anonymous online. I use their services a lot when I'm traveling to various conventions and shows while using public Wi-Fi. NordVPN can secure your traffic and block malware-ridden websites so you can browse the internet safely. You have the option to pick between any of their over 5,400 servers all over the world while keeping loading speeds fast. It's easy to connect as well. I have the app on my phone, streaming devices at home, and my computer. This makes it easy for Nord to act as more than just a simple VPN for all your devices. NordVPN provides you with tools like Nord Locker, which protects and encrypts your files, and also NordPass, which generates and stores very strong passwords. So, if you wanna check out NordVPN today, head on over to nordvpn.com completionist to try it risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, it's nordvpn.com completionist. Thanks again for sponsoring the show. And now, back to the video. Number 10. When you think of Final Fantasy, what comes to your mind? Epic storylines, gorgeous visuals, unbelievable orchestral scores. Well, I hope you especially like that last one because today at number 10, we're talking about Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call. Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy is a rhythm game featuring the best tracks from the entire series where you tap and slide the stylus across the bottom screen. It's very intuitive and a lot of fun with three different gameplay styles, field, battle, and event music. Field music features overworld music where you have to move right to left and slide the stylus accordingly. Battle music features a battle against multiple enemies where you tap the screen for your party to attack. Finally, there's event music that highlights some of the biggest moments in Final Fantasy history with the original Japanese cutscenes. Curtain Call also takes everything from the original theater rhythm and improves upon it. There are more monsters, more characters, and most importantly, more tracks, some of which even got new arrangements in this iteration. Modes got shaken up with a whole new versus mode now available, and a lot of under the hood changes occurred, like UI placement and retooling the scoring system, making Curtain Call an exceptional sequel in every way. Now, I understand that the chibi art style for the characters isn't for everyone, but I am a massive rhythm game buff, and I love Final Fantasy for that matter. But if you love Final Fantasy, Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call is a beautiful and unique love song to the fans, and it's a great way to celebrate the series. Number nine. Look, say what you will about Kirby, but that is a series that is never afraid to experiment. Let's make a whole world where everything's made of yarn. Let's make Kirby a golf ball. Let's put Kirby in a mech suit. And that last one is the one that makes today's list. Kirby Planet Robobot is both a goofy title to say and also tells the story of Kirby battling the Haltman Works Company led by President Max Prophet Haltman. Since Kirby slept through their invasion, he's now the only creature standing in the way of them conquering Planet Popstar. Planet Robobot features two big gameplay changes. The first is the ability to move between the background and the foreground, resulting in some fun 2.5D platforming. The second 
is mechs, my dudes. Well, it seems like these mechanized suits would detract from that classic Kirby goodness. They actually expanded to greatness by keeping the copy abilities and adding on improved mobility and a ton of destructive power. Kirby Planet Robobot Bobo -Bo -Bo Bot is an absolute blast with fun mech gameplay and great side modes like Team Kirby Clash and Kirby 3D Rumble, which both became full-fledged games on their own. Plus, it actually gets really difficult for a Kirby game, which I really appreciate. It's so satisfying, like a good night's sleep or a great meal, just like Kirby would want. And hey, if you need more Kirby goodness for Planet Robobot, here's my video on screen right now. You can check it out. I loved it. Operate. The Super Smash Bros. franchise has been one that I've loved from the very beginning. It was a celebration of so many of those schoolyard hypotheticals of which video game character would win in a fight, cranked up with zaniness and tons of heart. But this was a series that until 2014 was uniquely stuck inside. Well, that all changed in 2014 with the release of the incredibly originally named Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS. Now, one could argue that Smash for the Nintendo 3DS was the same as the Wii U. As someone who's completed both, with the Wii U one being twice for New Game Plus, I kind of teeter back and forth as to which one I agree with. There are many elements and aspects of the games that both align pretty similarly, but they both have their own unique content as well. 3DS had its own identity with unique levels such as Pac Maze and the Game Boy version of Dreamland. On top of this, there were two modes exclusive to the 3DS, Street Smash and Smash Run. Street Smash leaned on the 3DS's Street Pass feature and had you using tokens of characters to knock other players you'd pass off of platforms. In this case, you don't have to smash or pass, you can do both. But Smash Run was truly where it was at. It was essentially the city trial mode from Kirby Air Ride, but applied to Smash Brothers. Players would race to collect as many power-ups to make themselves faster, stronger, maybe even more defensive. Then a competition would randomly be chosen. It was a lot of fun and a great way to kill some time on your own or with friends. But the biggest highlight of Smash Brothers for the 3DS was finally getting to play with your friends wherever you all wanted to. I can't count the amount of times that me and some friends would just settle it in Smash. And yes, many have jumped over to the comfort of using their GameCube controllers when the Wii U version of Smash came out, but Super Smash Bros. for 3DS was still a fantastic time. It didn't just continue the series, it made it more accessible to everyone everywhere. And looking back at it now, it definitely helped pave the way for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate on the Nintendo Switch. Number 7 Whenever you think of portable video games, there is one series that always comes to mind. Pokemon. Fans were lucky enough to get four different mainline Pokemon released on the 3DS. And although a lot of them are great in their own unique ways, for this list, I'm gonna have to go with Pokemon Sun and Moon. First of all, this game looks stunning. The Alola region is based on Hawaii and it is absolutely gorgeous. It's probably the brightest and most colorful region in any Pokemon game to date. Seriously, going through those jungles and walking on those beaches was absolutely wonderful. Sun and Moon also introduced a ton of cool new Pokemon like Mimikyu, as well as regional forms of older Pokemon that can only be found in the Alola region like Sandshrew, Muk, and Executor. Look at this big ass palm tree man and tell me you don't love him. Most importantly, Sun and Moon represented a massive change in direction for the Pokemon franchise. The classic formula of eight gyms and an Elite Four was out the door. Instead, you were helping found the Pokemon League in this region and eventually becoming its first champion. Now, I know this wasn't the cosmic shift that many had been praying for, but anything that shakes some dust off the formula a bit is always welcome. And even at the time, it felt fairly novel. Now, it may seem strange putting Sun and Moon on here instead of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. The Ultra versions added a lot more content like Mantine Surfing, the Cantonian Gym, and a much bigger post game featuring Giovanni and Team Rainbow Rocket. But none of that compares to my initial experience with the Alola region because for the first time since the original Pokemon games, I felt like I was really starting something new. Number six. For as much grief as Square Enix can get sometimes, and trust me, nowadays they do deserve it, and for as much as I may always just want another new spin on something from Final Fantasy on their end, I really do appreciate when they try something completely different with regards to building a brand new franchise. Such is the case with their brand new IP on the 3DS at the time, 
Bravely Default, which is a great way for gamers to experience a present-day version of classic RPGs. It featured classic pixel art, but with spectacular modern flair. The story features the classic trope of four crystals that contain the power of the elements, but also has two endings that are dependent on your actions in the game. However, the most intriguing part of Bravely Default was the Brave in Default combat systems. Yes, battles are all turn-based, but you can take a chance and use all of your bravery points to execute multiple actions in a single turn. This risk-reward system may be simple in theory, but it is a lot of fun, leading to some fairly tense battles, and it really makes Bravely Default stand out from the pack. Now, a lot of this isn't necessarily groundbreaking, but when something is done so well, you gotta give credit where credit is due. Square Enix pulled all the stops in making this small portable game feel as big as the games we play at home. Everything from the beautiful soundtrack to the tragic story feels something like you'd get out of Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. Bravely Default is just a really really good original JRPG made by the studio best known for making great JRPGs. If you're a fan of the genre, you will not be disappointed. Number five. If there's ever one character that's fun for me personally to pick on time and time again, it's Luigi. His cowardice and greenness knows no bounds. But what's actually going on in that slippery little freak's head? Well. You get to find out in Mario & Luigi Dream Team. In Dream Team, the basic plot follows what usually happens in a Mario game, right? They go to a new locale, Pillow Island, Peach gets kidnapped, and the brothers have to save her. What's different though is that this game is split between two worlds the normal world, and Luigi's dream world. The regular world plays just like every other Mario & Luigi game, with timed attacks and 3D exploration and a dash of puzzle solving. Conversely, the dream world is entirely 2D with Mario operating solo. All of these levels are really inventive, with level layouts being affected by how you mess with Luigi on the touchscreen. For example, you can tug on Luigi's mustache to extend a platform for Mario to run across. This creativity continues with the dream world battles. Mario is alone, but Luigi can't support him by making his regular attacks stronger with dozens of Luigi's. Mario and Luigi Dream Team is yet another example of the type of creativity that can be done in the Mario universe. It's such a shame that the team that made these games are no longer with us. I love the Mario and Luigi Superstar games, so if you want to see more of those on the channel, please let me know. This is easily the best Mario game that takes place in a dream. That's right, Mario 2, I'm looking at you. Did you know that Mario 2 was originally called Doki Doki Panic and it wasn't a Mario game at all? Did you know that, Internet? Did you know? Number four. I've been a fan of Mario Kart ever since the series debuted on the Super Nintendo. It just seems like it gets better with each new generation. Mario Kart Double Dash is still the best one. And although Mario Kart 8 Deluxe may be one of the best-selling games of all time, Mario Kart 7 established everything that makes 8 great. Gliding, racing underwater, choosing the different parts of your kart all started right here. Hell, looking at my time with the 3DS, I spent more time playing Mario Kart 7 than any other game. The single-player gameplay is great for completionists. Beating 150cc of any cup results in unlocking new characters, some of which haven't made an appearance since, like Honey Queen and Wiggler. I'm sure there's a petition floating around online for Nintendo to let them race once again, even if it's just in Mario Kart Tour. But of course, a Mario Kart game is only as strong as its tracks, and whoo boy! Mario Kart 7 has some killer tracks that absolutely rock in multiplayer. And honestly, Mario Kart 7 might have the best special cup of any Mario Kart, with DK Jungle, Rosalina's Ice World, and killer versions of both Bowser's Castle and Rainbow Road. They're all bangers, and their music only makes you want to push the gas even harder, making Mario Kart 7 an absolute state to any 3DS library. Number three. There is sometimes a debate regarding which is better, 2D Mario or 3D Mario. 2D Mario is all about momentum and speed with games like Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World. Meanwhile, 3D Mario is more about epic platforming with the likes of Mario Galaxy and Mario Odyssey. But if you're not sure which way to go, might I recommend a game that kind of does both? Super Mario 3D Land takes everything that works in 2D and 3D Mario and combines it into a beautiful amalgamation of maneuverability and tricky platforming that feels so satisfying to execute. Plus, we get the return of Tanuki Mario and the introduction of Kitsune Luigi. 3D Land is also one of the few games on this list that really feels improved with the 3D feature turned on. Yeah, remember 3D in the 3DS? Well, as an isometric platformer, 3D Land's 3D is implemented 
wanted to better assist and ensure player precision. It's not necessarily something that is required to be cranked all the way up to, but it both doesn't feel like a gimmick and certainly can give players a better sense of depth when darting through these masterfully crafted levels. Super Mario 3D Land also expertly set the stage for Super Mario 3D World's success, which yeah, may make Land seem less desirable since it may not have four player co-op or HD graphics, but the amount of imagination packed into this single 3DS experience is truly admirable. And hey, here's my video on it right here if you wanna check it out. I was blown away with 3D Land, although I really did hate the completion hiccup I ran into. Check out the video to learn more. Number two. Super Metroid is one of my favorite games of all time. So when I heard that a new 2D Metroid game was coming out for the 3DS, I was pumped. I was especially shocked because Nintendo low-key announced this after announcing Metroid Prime 4, which, uh, wow. That aged really well, huh? I was even more excited when I heard that it was a remake of Metroid 2, since that was the only entry in the series that I never actually got to play. Metroid Samus Returns is a wonderful modern update to a game that was pretty bare bones compared to the other games in the series since it was released on the Game Boy. And although I tried to make this list without any remakes or ports, I feel comfortable in saying that Metroid Samus Returns is a completely different game. Right out the gate, players can feel that Samus is much more action-driven. Gone are the days of clicky aiming. Where do you want to shoot? You can absolutely have Samus shoot exactly right there. Beyond improved aiming though, the biggest change comes with the counter attack. This physical swing of Samus's gun arm would deal a bunch of damage to any enemy that came close to her, and it felt so satisfying to pull off. The retool movement options immediately made me dig this game, and the cinematics throughout the narrative drew me in even further. But what made me truly love Samus Returns was figuring out what the completion criteria was. Now, back in the day when Nintendo used to like me, I used to get games before they were released. And at that time, that's kind of the chaos I love about The Completionist, right? I had no idea what the completion criteria was. However, I had a hunch that if you beat each mode under four hours, you could unlock a special pose at the end of the game. Did I go a little crazy routing and rerouting the map? Yes, but you know what? I was kind of right. I got the metrics somewhat wrong, but I was very close to nailing it out the park. Getting to play this game and figure out everything hidden within it is exactly what The Completionist is about. Anyone can look at guides and there's no shame in that, but to play through a game and learn everything that it has to offer before anyone else in the world gets to do that? That's something special. And that's why Metroid Samus Returns is so special to me specifically. If you wanna watch my video on that, you can check it out right here. Number one. As previously mentioned, when making this list, I tried to steer very clear from including any remakes or ports. And the Nintendo 3DS had a ton of them, like Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Star Fox, all three, which are incredible, by the way. Some of the greatest games of all time were translated to portable form, and that's no small feat. But even when you take those master classes in gaming into account here, for me, and if you know my channel, there's no question what my number one is. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds is a beautiful follow-up to my favorite Zelda game of all time, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. It takes the same sense of adventure from the first game and flips it on its head, or more accurately, 90 degrees to the side. Being able to turn into a moving painting and traverse the walls is a wild new way to explore Hyrule, and one that has no right to be as versatile as it is. It also allows you to explore Low Rule, the dark antithesis to Hyrule. This not only shows a bleaker version of Zelda's kingdom, but introduces you to wonderful new characters like Princess Hilda, the sorcerer Yuga, and the mysterious Ravio, who will rent out the different items needed to complete the game. This rental system gave the player a series first at the time, the unique ability to finish the dungeons in whatever order you wanted to. That's right, A Link Between Worlds had that open completion feeling way before Breath of the Wild came around. The thing that I love most about this game is what it represents in my time and career here on YouTube as the completionist. Link Between Worlds marks the beginning of my history with working with Nintendo. I was involved in the game's marketing and even got to complete the game before it was officially released. That's not only a big moment for me as a person, but for this channel. Because of all of that and so much more, The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds is one of my favorite Zelda games of all time and is easily the best game on the Nintendo 3DS 
in my opinion. With that said, those are my absolute favorite Nintendo 3DS games. Let me know what yours are in the comments down below. And what was your first 3DS game that you actually bought? Or what were some of your favorite games that you just found by exploring the Nintendo 3DS eShop? Maybe it was Kirby's Blowout Blast. Dylan's Dead Heat Breakers, Maze Breaker 6. Let me know all about those eShop games in the comments down below. That's it, that's all guys, and I'll see you all next time.